Hello and welcome to the Frontiers of Research podcast, where we talk to researchers pushing back the frontiers of scientific knowledge. In this episode, we're going to delve into the intriguing topic of social behaviors all the way from bacteria to birds and humans. I'm Brandy Baker, a member of the communications team here at the ERC, and I'll be speaking to Professor West, a prominent evolutionary biologist based at the University of Oxford. He's also studied or worked at prestigious institutions, including the University of Cambridge, Imperial College London, the University of Edinburgh, and has conducted research at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. Hello and welcome, Professor West. Hi, Brady. Thanks for having me here. Let's jump right into this fascinating topic. These are exciting times uh, for the field of evolutionary biology, and we're getting deeper insights into the evolution of cooperation, altruism, and social complexity. But before starting, could you briefly explain the different types of social behaviors that affect an organism's ability to survive and reproduce? Sure. So we define a social behavior as one that has consequences, and by which I mean fitness consequences, so the ability to survive and reproduce, for both the individual performing it and the recipient of the behavior. So for example, cooperation is when an individual does something which benefits another individual. And then we can divide cooperation up into altruistic cooperation, which is when someone does something at a cost to themselves to help another individual. A good example of this is something like meerkats from nature documentaries where you'll see some individuals instead of breeding on their own, they help rear the offspring of other individuals. Or you might get mutually beneficial cooperation is the other sort. So that might be something like, for example, when wolves hunt together. So that's cooperation. We can also think of other behaviors like a selfish behavior, when an individual does something to benefit itself at a cost to others, like stealing a bit of food. Mm -hmm. Or you can even get spiteful behaviors where an individual does something which is costly to itself, but also to costly to other individuals. Some bacteria literally blow themselves up to release molecules that will destroy other bacteria. Goodness. And, but what is fascinating is that these social behaviors are occurring at the smallest levels of life and in some of the simplest organisms. Single cells without brains can react to their surroundings to survive in their own microscopic universes. And we know altruism occurs in certain bacteria which communicate with each other, triggering a coordinated response from the entire bacterial community or slime cities, as you referred to them. Why do some individuals act altruistically or cooperate with others, even at a cost of themselves? So with bacteria, the most common form of social cooperative behavior that occurs is that a lot of bacteria release factors from outside the cell. So an individual cell will pay a cost of producing something. It's released out from the cell but then it provides a benefit to the local group of cells. And there's a whole variety of things that they do. It could be to go and collect iron. It could be to break, break down protein. It could be to hinder the immune response of the host. And so these behaviors are sort of analogous to what economists would call a public good game. So individuals are paying the cost to do something which benefits the whole group. It's so really interesting. And can studying social behaviors in other species provide insights into human social interactions? Yes. I mean, so one of the great things about evolutionary biology in general is that we should be able to sort of provide a single conceptual understanding at all levels of life. So theoretical explanations that we have for why bacteria cooperate can be the same as why birds cooperate, why the same as humans cooperate. So for example, one of the, the, the most important things to explain cooperation at all levels of, of the tree of life is interactions between relatives. Natural selection is about getting your genes to the next generation. If you're helping a relative reproduce, you're still helping get your genes to the next generation. It's just that you're doing it indirectly by helping another individual who has copies of those genes rather than reproducing yourself. Once you've got that framework in mind, you can see very analogous things happening uh, across yeah, bacteria, insects, birds, humans. Mm -hmm. And they don't only play a crucial role in the evolution of life and give us a better understanding of our own behavior, but they also have practical applications in medicine and conservation and understanding human societies. Maybe we need to go back to the bacteria for this one. Okay, yeah, <laughs> sure. So I talked about bacteria producing um, factors which they release from the cell and that benefit the local population of cells. And it turns out that most of these things which we as evolutionary biologists would say these are cooperative traits or cooperative behaviors, um, microbiologists tend to call them virulence factors because they're associated with pathogenic bacteria doing better and causing more harm to their host. Mm -hmm. So they're better able to grow and infect. So if we can manipulate these things, if we can interrupt them, then we can have very significant effects on the nastiness basically of bacteria. 
So for example, if you have a normal strain of bacteria that cooperates infecting mice, um, you can have very high virulence. If you mix in a sort of non-cooperating cheat that doesn't do those things, it messes up the cooperative behavior and will severely reduce the damage done to the host. Right, so on, on this point on cheating bacteria, can you say a little bit more about how that would work with combating like infectious diseases in humans? So the, there's various ways that you can do it. The simplest is if you put in a non-cooperative cheat, it will interfere with the cooperation. And so that reduces the ability of the, the, the population of bacteria to grow successfully. They don't grow as well. They don't cause as much damage. There's also more fancy things that you can do. Uh, there's a lot of work being done on this in viruses, which, which we can call cheat therapy, where you use cheats to go in and disrupt infections. There's a possibility for fancier things. We could use cheats as a way to get um, traits that are interesting into a, an infection. So, for example, if you had a population that was antibiotic resistant, it is possible in theory that we could be introducing uh, susceptibility to antibiotics as a sort of Trojan horse strategy by putting um, cheap bacteria into an infection. And this, is, this is really fascinating. <laughs> and could you just explain a little bit more about this interdisciplinary approach to, to the work that you do and perhaps a little bit on how ERC funding has helped well? Yeah, sure. So I use a, a mixture of approach and really across a mixture of organisms. So my group does mathematical theory. We do very broad across species data sets, which are sort of taking data from the literature. We do experimental work and we do genomic work. And we do this across all organisms, like viruses, bacteria, insects, birds, humans. And this is obviously partly only, I think two things make this possible. One is I have an amazing team of collaborators that I've gradually acquired over the years that are real experts in different areas but also the ERC funding is crucial for this. So really allowing to do, us to do these big broad projects which tackle things in sort of similar but complementary directions in different species. And I think the really great thing about trying to do this in general and to work at this scale is that the job of an evolutionary biologist, I think, or one of the jobs of an evolutionary biologist is try and make the world simpler to explain. We can look for these generalities across different species and across the tree of life. So rather than having a lot of separate explanations for things, we can have a big framework that really explains everything more simply. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> so a good team, very broad and integrative uh, approach. And can you share an example of a particularly interesting finding from your research? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, one interesting finding that we've had the theoretically, actually, which just relates to the sort of cheating we were talking on mm -hmm. earlier, there's mm -hmm. this very strange life history in viruses where in some species, the whole genome isn't packaged and passed on together into the same infection. It's fragmented into different bits, segmented, and these are all passed on separately. Now, this seems crazy if you think of it from a sort of just a normal personal benefit. Why would you divide up your genome and package it in different ways and pass it on? And, and this has been very hard to explain. So previous explanations for this have tried to think, well, could there be some big benefit that we're just missing? And it's really hard to find them. So what we found, though, is that this could actually just be, have come from the evolution of cheating. So you can have one little fragment of a genome that drops a certain part of the rest of the genome, and that allows it to reproduce more quickly, and so that enables it to invade. And then so this fragmentation really represents, or segmentation really represents different cheating genomes that have all popped up and are mixing together. So it's not something that's happening for the good of this species, it's really just showing the sort of social conflict going on. Right. So before we wrap up, um, what do you see as a, the future directions of uh, research in the evolution of social behaviours? Maybe it builds on what you've just mentioned. Yeah. So I think one of the really, really exciting big things we can do now is what I'd call social genomics. Mm. And so advances in genomics and the amount of and quality of genetic data we're having, I think, has two very big consequences. So one we can use it to study cooperation in natural populations in ways that just wasn't possible before. So when we're working on something like birds or insects, it's very easy to go out in the field and we can watch them cooperate, we can do things and we can see them and we can really see what happens in nature. Mm -hmm. If we're working on bacteria, we can do amazing lab experiments, we can do genetic manipulations, yeah. but it's, 
it's harder to, to really know what's really happening in nature. We can't see it. You know, these are invisible things. It's harder to study the behavior of them. But what you can do with genomics is you can go out and look for signatures of what's been going on, almost footprints. So we can't ab directly observe cooperation and sort of cooperation between relatives, but we can say if it is going on, we would see these sort of footprints of it in, at the genomic level. So we can go and use the genomics to infer what's happening out there in the natural world. Right. I find like they're footprints of the, yeah. <laughs> the, the smallest level of life. So thank you so much for sharing um, your research insights with us today. And I think one thing I've learned is that we need bacteria that work together, but also some of those cheating ones. While natural selection favors genes that increase an organism's ability to survive and reproduce, the world is not as selfish as one might think. And cooperation, as you've discussed, can be found at all levels, offering profound implications for understanding the complexity of life and perhaps beyond. Yeah, no, I mean, I couldn't agree more strongly. I mean, actually, really complex life on Earth is, is built by cooperation. I mean, we are an amazing multicellular cooperative organism that has uh, evolved from single-celled organisms ourselves. And if you, if you look from the simplest replicating or molecules up to complex animal societies, that's required a few major evolutionary transitions, which are all about cooperating. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in to this episode of Frontiers of Research. Stay curious, and we'll see you next time.